So this past Monday, I headed out on a road trip to the beautiful Oregon coast. I had been contacted by Desi, a viewer who wanted to donate an Amiga 1000 to the channel. I always love an excuse to go see more of this beautiful state, so our first stop was Lincoln City to meet Desi. Here is Desi after showing me around his awesome lab. Unlike my digital basement, he has views of the Pacific Ocean. He's a big Amiga fan, but just didn't have room for yet another Amiga, especially one that needed some repair. After leaving Desi's house, we headed up the coast to visit the Tillamook Cheese Factory and store. Inside, you can see them actually making and packaging the fantastic Tillamook cheese. The Tillamook Creamery is a farmer co-op and makes some wonderful and delicious dairy products. No visit is complete without a stop for some of their delicious ice cream. I had Oregon hazelnut and salted caramel. Man, it was good. Desi gave me a box full of stuff along with the Amiga 1000, and this is it in the back of the car. So I think it's time to check out what I brought home, and let's get right to it. Alright, let's start right from the top. This is an Amiga 1000. Originally designed by the company called Amiga and then bought by Commodore. This was the very first Amiga computer that dates back to around 1985. And this machine was way ahead of its time. Things are a little funny here as you see <laughs> something sticking out of the disk drive. We'll take a look at this in a second. The front of the Amiga has a little access panel and if we take this off, Behind here is a RAM expansion card. This was actually a way to officially upgrade the RAM on your Amiga 1000. I'm glad that this covers here because I think when these are missing, these are rather hard to find. Looking at the right side of the machine, we have two 9-pin input jacks used for joysticks or mice. And then there's some type of cover here, which I think comes, comes off. There we go. This is an expansion edge connector. For some type of sidecar expansions, probably things like hard drives and processor and RAM expansions. Looking at the left side of the computer, there's a power switch here and a bunch of leftover adhesive from some stuff that someone has stuck on at some point. And here we are on the back of the machine. Here is a keyboard input jack and the case is a little bit bowed right here and there seems to be a piece missing. So this machine must have been dropped at some point in its life. We have a parallel port, floppy drive expansion port, a DB25 serial port, right and left audio output jacks, RGB video port, some type of a DIN connector that says TV mod, so some RF modulator type device, and next to that, a composite video output. And finally, there's a grate with a fan behind it. Also on the back, tucked under here, is the IEC power input for the power supply. What's neat about this computer is underneath it, there's actually room for the keyboard to be tucked under there when you're not using the machine. There's a space underneath the machine where the keyboard cable can tuck under and then come out the front where the keyboard is. So the outside of the Amiga 1000 is entirely made out of plastic and it's pretty dirty and scuffed up with some yellowing here and on the back so some Retrobrite will be needed to make this thing look as good as new. But I think with a little elbow grease and some magic eraser this will clean up quite nicely. So I think all the screws are already out of this machine so I think I can actually just remove the top. Yep, it came right off. And right away this reveals a large RF shield which is already unscrewed, so I can lift that out. And we get our first glimpse of the inside of this computer. So the front of this machine is very loose, and I think this RAM card is holding it on. So I'm gonna try to pull this thing off. Here's the RAM expansion card. 256 kilobytes. And the front cover says Starpoint Software from Yreka, California. Anyone recognize this price tag? It's from Microworld, $79.95 plus tax. It's my favorite MT or Micron Technology RAM from back then on the Commodore 64s. You know, this stuff is always bad. But these are 256K chips, which I think might be more reliable. All right, with that off, I think this front cover should come right off the computer, which it does. There's the front cover with the awesome Amiga logo and name. Notice it doesn't say Commodore anywhere on this computer, at least on the front. So yes, we could see something interesting is going on. There's a GoTech installed in here, and there's some creative mounting here. Desi told me when he got this machine, the disk drive was completely non-functional and broken. And this GoTech does work. Hanging off the front is a little OLED screen. There's a rotary encoder for selecting the drive image and then a little piezo speaker. He didn't have a 3D printer at the time, so he had no way to mount this. So he came with, with some creative mounting that used some cut up 
plastic utensils. So you might notice this machine has this daughter card right here. Now this is actually original. This is a Rev-A motherboard, which was the original NTSC Amiga 1000s. And it came with this daughter card installed that just has additional logic and PAL chips on it. The Amiga 1000 released in other markets, like the one in Europe with PAL, or even the ones in Japan that were also NTSC, they didn't have this daughter card, and these chips were just integrated onto the motherboard itself. Here's the main 68000 processor, and interesting is this installed onto an extra card. This computer appears to have a RAM expansion installed in it that goes under the processor on this daughter card here. There's a product name, Insider 2, with copyright 1989, and DKB Software is the designer of this board. This card includes a real-time clock for the Amiga, and funny is this is the actual same chip as the one that was in that Compact Desk Pro video series I did. It has a battery underneath here, so it's almost certain that the battery is likely dead in this clock. But luckily there are modern replacements for this, and it looks like it's a socket, and that's because this is designed to go underneath normal ROM chips. But in this application, there is no additional ROM chip installed on top of it. I did some Googling and this card supports up to 1.5 megabytes of additional RAM for this Amiga. And these 12 DIP chips here are what make up that RAM expansion. With that card installed in the machine along with what's on the front of this computer, this gives this machine a total of 2 megabytes, which is quite a lot for a machine from 1985. It'll be a little bit hard to see, but this is the original CPU socket. And there's a little bit of a riser installed here. And then the CPU is plugged into the top board. And all the other signals from this expansion card just go through the CPU socket. There is one extra wire here that comes from the board and goes down to something on the motherboard. I assume it's some kind of a signal that's just not available on the CPU socket. Okay, I think it's time to power this up and we'll look at the faults that this thing has. I have an Amiga video cable here plugged into my SCART converter box and I just plugged in a power cord. Let's give this a power cycle. Well, we got a gray screen, which is a good sign. I think that's what Amigas do when you first turn them on. All right, there it is, the Amiga Kickstart. Wow, so I'm very excited. What Desi tells me about this machine is that it does work. It fully works. It runs software, it runs boots into Workbench without issue. The problem is, he says, there's something going on with the audio. He said he's done some work on the motherboard by changing caps and the audio jacks already, but he wasn't able to rectify the situation and he decided before he did any potential damage to it to stop what he was doing. And then he contacted me to hand this machine off to me. Okay, I also got this from Desi. It's the original Amiga 1000 keyboard. It's a little dirty, but luckily it has no broken keys. And overall, it seems to be in really good shape. So let me plug this in, it uses a normal phone wire and unlike the Macintosh Plus or 120 or 512, this has standard wiring. So you don't risk damaging the computer by using a regular phone cable. That has probably killed countless original Mac keyboards by people replacing the cable with a regular phone wire. Desi also gave me the original Amiga 1000 mouse. It's a tank mouse, but different than on a 2000 is it has this type of connection on it. Standard nine pin but it's a nice kind of side angled one. So when you plug it into the computer, it doesn't just stick straight out. As far as I'm aware, I could just use a regular Amiga mouse on this thing without any issue. But this of course just means that it all looks a little bit better on the table. Desi also gave me a little flash drive, which has the kickstart images on here necessary to get this thing working. There's a little OLED screen here and there's flash floppy firmware installed. So it's loading kickstart. That was the one that came out by default. And that should get to the point where I have to switch to a workbench disk to boot this the rest of the way. On an Amiga, Kickstart is sort of like the kernel that runs the entire machine. And in later Amigas, it was contained in a ROM chip on the motherboard, so you didn't need to stick a floppy disk into it. On this Amiga, it actually loads it off a disk into RAM, which is negative in one way in that it takes some of your RAM away. But the positive thing is, you can upgrade to a newer Kickstart version by just changing the floppy disk. And a workbench disk is what loads the entire graphical operating system. Although there's already a subset of the operating system in the Kickstart ROM, which is running in RAM. And that's how you can have a disk with a game on it that basically loads what looks like a graphical operating system, but the disk is full of the game and it's not filled up with an operating system. So there we are, the machine is booted. The mouse is moving as normal, but also is this disk is called Kickwork. And Desi told me that that was on this thumb drive. And what the kick work is, it's a single floppy disk image that has both Kickstart and Workbench in one. So instead of booting Kickstart and then having to switch to a Workbench disk, this is a minimal Workbench that has a lot of features removed, I suppose, 
that is just enough to get the computer booted without needing to change the floppy. But what this allows us to do is allows us to validate that this machine is totally working. And right here, what's really neat is this machine has almost two megs of RAM in it. So the motherboard itself has 256K. This card on the front of the machine has another 256K, so that's 512 total. And then this board obviously contains 1.5 megabytes of RAM. All right, so let's check out what version of Workbench we're running here. The versions that popped up are Kickstart 34.5 and Workbench 34.28. There's a great article on ClassicAmiga.com about Kickstart ROMs and what it all means. I'll link to it in the description below. But this explains the whole thing about how the Amiga 1000 had to load it into RAM from a disk. And the Amiga 2000, the successor to the 1000, was the first machine where it was in ROM. And there we are, version 34.5, which is what this machine just booted, is the equivalent of Kickstart 1.3. This particular Kickstart ROM was pretty widespread coming on the 1000, 500, 2000, and 3000. Released in 88, it says the ROM size is 256K, so I assume loading this off a of floppy disk takes up 256K of RAM, which means the great thing this machine has this RAM expansion. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do very much with just 256K. The Amiga 1000 does have a bootstrap, and that is 8 kilobytes on, on the motherboard, and that's what allows it to actually boot the floppy disk. Shows that graphic picture that said insert the kickstart disk. It seems that kickstart and workbench 1.3, which is what you see right here, was the very last version that runs on the Amiga 1000. All the following versions required Amiga 500 or 2000 or higher to work. Okay, I want to do a quick test of this audio problem. I've booted a kickstart disk, I think kickstart 1.2, which was on this thumb drive and I just changed it to be Rainbow Islands. What's neat is once you boot the Kickstart, it actually stays in RAM. So even doing a Control Amiga Amiga, which restarts the Amiga, it doesn't need the Kickstart disk anymore. Okay, I just selected Marble Madness. Let's reboot this thing again, see if Marble Madness is working better. I think the Amiga port of Marble Madness was pretty good, pretty close to the arcade, at least from a graphics standpoint. This game was ported to a lot of different machines and it just didn't look great on a lot of them. So I'm not getting any sound out of this channel at all. So that's not working. Let's try the other one that was buzzy. So I have this speaker here and yep, all I'm getting is buzzing out of that channel. The other channel, we're getting absolutely no sound at all. So I think whatever's going on, there's some type of a fault here. So indeed, this machine has faults with the audio output, but I think it should be totally fixable. It will just require some inspection, which I will get to in a future video. For now, let me just get back to looking at the stuff that Desi gave me. So I was moving the Amiga out of the way when I looked and I noticed that the top lid has all the signatures from the people that worked on the 1000. Kind of reminds me of the early Macintosh because I think the early Macs also had that. Not all of these people are with us anymore. Some of these designers have passed away. Okay, moving on. I got a box here full of stuff. Mostly Desi told me this was stuff he got with the 1000, but there's other stuff here that probably came from other things and he just didn't need them, so we passed them on to me. We have a very dusty box of floppy disks. Kickstart 1.3, another Kickstart disk, Sky Chase, Deluxe Paint 3, Test Drive 2, Star Glider 2, just some classic Amiga titles, copies of course. And we have one of the original Amiga 1000 floppy drives here, external. Even the original Amiga drives had a pass-through connector, and I think you could plug in up to three external drives to have a total of four disk drives when you include the internal one. And yeah, this is the original Amiga 1010 disk drive. Now I actually have another Amiga 1000 disk drive I got with one of my other Amigas at some point. And I'm wondering if the disk drive that's from this will actually work internal to the computer itself. Because I wouldn't mind having the original disk drive back in there if possible. Although the GoTech is immeasurably more useful, but converting an external drive into a GoTech and making the internal one be the actual regular floppy drive would just be a little bit more original for me. So if you're aware that this drive is able to go inside the computer, if I could take the mechanism out, I'd love to know. Let me know in the comment section below, please. And we have what was probably the original floppy drive cage, model number JU36303. So this was probably in the machine originally, Matsushita Communications, made in Japan. The original floppy drive probably screwed into this top cover and then these tabs here screwed down onto standoffs on the motherboard in the original computer. So with this and a replacement mechanism, I could put the original floppy drive back in the machine. What we have here, ah, an original Commodore data set, a very, very, very dirty one. Look at this cable here. This is <laughs> it's pretty filthy. The whole, the whole drive is uh, pretty dirty. Let's see, does it eject? It certainly does. 
These are one of the earlier data sets. I think these were either sold with the pets or they were sold with the VIC-20, at least when the VIC-20 first came out. Right here is obviously uh, 1541. Looks like someone has done some mods. There's a little square hole there. Looks like an extra LED of some kind. Maybe there was originally two LEDs here. And on the side of the drive, there's also a rectangular hole, very nicely cut. Back of the drive is not changed up at all, so this doesn't have any kind of parallel mod or anything. But this thing is very, very dirty. Okay, in the box here, what's next? Ah, uh, this is probably the original keyboard cable from the Amiga 1000. It's very stretched out, but if you saw my compact video series, I did restore the cable by heating it and then winding it backwards in the end. Yes, thanks for, for everyone who gave me those tips on reversing the coil. That does make it tight. So it'll be interesting to uh, actually do that test on this thing. I'd like to use this again. Although actually it looks like the little tab is broken off on this connector. And I don't know if I have a crimper, so I suppose I have no way to make this work again. So that's a shame. I have a little parts assortment. So here's a gender changer. And I remember Desi told me that he included this because the parallel port specifically on the Amiga 1000 is slightly different than every other 25 pin parallel port out there like PCs and the other Amigas. Two of the pins are swapped. So he included this where he swapped the wires internally. Looks like the original floppy power cable is in here and a bunch of screws. These are probably original ones for the case. And we have a standoff here, which is beige, probably broke off from somewhere in the computer. I think he mentioned this was from inside the keyboard. So yeah, it's nice he included this. I can epoxy that back into the keyboard. Next up, uh, we have the C128 introductory guide. Uh, he said he didn't have any Commodore 128, so he was going to pass this along to me. And I do have more than one 128, so that's, that's quite handy. This manual is just a little bit of instructions on how to use a computer, how to plug everything in, how to set it up. This is quite clear and probably very helpful to people who was, were getting a Commodore 128 as their first computer. Okay, next up, uh, we have a Commodore 64 power brick, and it's very, very, very dirty. If you have one of these, I recommend you do not use any of these original Commodore bricks, and that's specifically because the power output of this on the 5 volt rail, there's a voltage regulator that uses some resistors to control the voltage output. And as those resistors drift over time, especially because this thing can run really hot, the voltage can go up dramatically on this. You might be getting seven volts out of this thing to your five volt rail, or when you plug this into your 64, that goes directly into a lot of the chips in the machine, which can permanently damage your 64. So definitely find yourself a different power supply and don't use these original ones. There are videos out there on the internet about re-bricking or rebuilding your C64 power supply. The ones in North America, at least, are the ones just like this one you see here. They are solidly potted. They are not easy to rebuild. You have to basically take out the entire inside of the power supply with force and then reinstall brand new components inside. I'll put a link to this video here where this guy shows you how to extricate the internal by slamming it down on a table once you build a little jig out of wooden parts to get the insides out. And as you see, He's pushing really hard out oh, there. It just came out. <laughs> I've done this myself on one of my power supplies. It's not exactly easy, but it does work and it allows you to reuse that entire case and reuse the cabling that you had already on the power supply. And then we have one more thing in here and they are some PCBs. And I actually kind of forgot what these are for. Desi told me, it says something about RS-232 and plip box. Again, this doesn't really jog my memory, but this was something interesting when he told me about it, something that's worth building. So I'll need to check this out. I'll put this link in the description below so anyone can check this out yourself. All right, so that's everything in the box, but there's actually a few more things that I got from Desi. All right, so if you watch my channel, you probably know how much I like these things. It's a Commodore 64 with the cardboard RF shield. This will go immediately into the trash. So we have one 64. We have another 64, also with its crappy RF shield attached. And we have a third 64. Well, that's gonna be it for this video. A huge thank you to Desi for donating all this stuff to the channel, I really appreciate it. I've always wanted an Amiga 1000, so it'll be really fun to repair this thing and get it back to working order and looking perfectly brand new again, if possible. For the Commodore 64 main boards and the 1541 disk drive, there'll be some videos coming out very soon showing the repairs of those. And then there are some other cool videos in the pipeline that should be coming out soon as well. So make sure you subscribe to catch all the future videos that I post. 
course, if you like this video, I'd love it if you give me a thumbs up on it. Or if you didn't, you know what to do, you can give me a thumbs down. Put your comments and your suggestions down in the comment section below. And thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.